Well, welcome everyone. Thank you so much for coming out on this cold and rainy night. I'm glad we didn't have ice and snow this evening. I'm Liz Germer. I'm the Director of Special Education and Student Services here in Falls Church City Public Schools. And I'm delighted that we've got such a great turnout and to have the opportunity to present some information to you that might help you with your students and to learn more about the topic of executive functioning. Um, I also want to invite you, uh, if you have a student in Falls Church City Public Schools and you'd like to attend our Special Education Advisory Committee meetings, we have our upcoming meeting on Monday night, next Monday night. It's at 7 p.m. It's going to be here at Mary Ellen Henderson Middle School. We'll have some staff from the special education program here talk a little bit about the services that they provide and some of the unique things that happen here for our students with disabilities at Mary Ellen Henderson. So please come and join us. We have monthly meetings and we'd love to have members of the community participate and join our meeting. So I am going to introduce to you Diane Monick who is from the ARC of Northern Virginia and who played an integral part in helping to sponsor this presentation for us. Diane? Hi, good evening everyone. I won't take up a lot of time. I want George to have all his, his workshop time. Um, I just wanted to introduce myself. I'm Diane Monty. From, I'm the transition manager at the ARC of Northern Virginia. Are most of you familiar with the ARC of Northern Virginia or heard no? So I'll give a really quickie um, overview. We are located in um, Falls Church, it's really the Merrifield area. Our footprint is um, Fairfax County, City of Falls Church, Arlington, and Alexandria. And we are the local chapter of a national organization. And we provide primarily um, information and referral and advocacy services. Um, we have, I have a lot of information over there and we have a great website. And there's a little form that tells you how to sign up for our online resources. Um, it's an e-newsletter that comes out every week, tells about things that are happening in the community. But one of the big things that we do, like I said, is information and referrals. So we do a lot of workshops. Our umbrella program is called Transition Points, where we look at different um, parts of the lifespan of a person with a disability, from early intervention, through special ed, through transitioning out of school, through employment, housing, and then finally aging with a disability. For each of those transition points, we do webinars and workshops, and we've created those colored guides that are over there um, that are all available on, for download on our website. I only had a few to hand out tonight, but they're all available. The other thing we do is a special needs trust program. Um, there's a lot of information over there about that. Uh, special Needs Trust is, uh, if you're not familiar with it, is if you have a child with a disability and you want to uh, enable your child to be eligible for benefits, SSDI, um, Medicaid waiver services, you would want to, any money you leave your child, you would want to put into a Special Needs Trust in order to maintain their eligibility for public benefits. So there's information about that over there. Um, all of the workshops that we do are also always done as a webinar, and we have a YouTube channel, so those are good um, resources for you. We've done uh, workshops on um, everything from legal authority, like guardianship, power of attorney, to special needs trust, to Medicaid waiver. I also have a lot of information over there on Medicaid waiver. The other big thing that we do at the ARC is state and local advocacy. Um, Virginia is ranked 39th in the state, in the country, for providing services, community supports, and funding for people with disabilities. So there's a strong need for advocacy. We have a super director of advocacy. If you're interested in learning about how to do that, meet with legislators, um, attend budget hearings, get involved with that. I have information over there. And I'll be here um, the rest of the night, so if you want to talk at the end or if you have any questions, I'm happy to, to answer. Okay. And with that, I will turn it over to George Rathbone. Um, he, is, he is the owner and director, executive director of Developmental Support Associates. He, we have worked with George for a very long time. We share office space um, at the ARC. And he, uh, we, one of the things that we do is a transition series every fall in partnership with Marymount University to help families and, and students transition out of high school to make sure you know all the topics that can help you as you leave the school system. And George played an integral role in helping us with both the adult track of that series as well as the student track. So 
Um, I'm glad he's here tonight to share information with you. And with that, I will turn it over to you. Thank you. Thanks, Diane. Um, first of all, let me put in a plug. The Ark of Northern Virginia, I've worked in Maryland, Virginia, D.C. Um, I think this is a top advocacy organization that I've been associated with, and they do a really good job, and they put a lot of effort, and there's a lot of information and resources that are helpful. You do need to plan ahead if you have a child who may need support into their adult life. Um, I got the chance to talk uh, with Liz Berner when I first came in here, and I'm very glad I did. I did not understand that uh, Falls Church City Public Schools were not Fairfax schools. And it dawned on me that the reason I don't know that is because I've never had families approaching me because they're very unhappy. In, in, uh, I mean, I have a lot in Fairfax, honestly, and Loudoun and various other places, but um, we got to talk about some of the resources they have, and I think we're very lucky here in Falls Church. It sounds like actually there are a lot of resources put into trying to keep people out. Oh, yes, there are, compared to what I'm seeing out there. But a disclaimer, my organization and myself usually get called when someone's pretty unhappy with what's going on. And so I don't see all the satisfied people. What I do know is that there is really good work going on everywhere in this field. People come into it with good hearts. Um, I have more concerns about how systems function. Um, but uh, I, I guess I'd like to start out, how many people here have someone in their family who's considered to have executive function problems? Okay. Um, how many of you have ever dealt with, uh, with a family member who had executive function problems? All right, actually, every, every hand should go up with that because every baby, has no executive functioning when they start out, okay? And, uh, and uh, basically, um, one of the things I want to address is the concept of typical versus atypical. And part of that, how many of you have kids who are considered to have a disability? Quite a few. So that's something I'm gonna be a little controversial about, although we need to use that language. That's the way everything's set up in the state, that's how you access resources, that's how you access money. But it is my belief that people don't have disabilities, they have conditions. And the conditions can be disabling under certain circumstances. So I, I want to start out before getting into executive functioning about um, with really some a little bit of philosophy. Disabilities do not reside in a person, but in the interaction between the person and their environment. And it's really all about getting your needs and wants met. And uh, basically, whoop. it decides the pace of this uh, presentation. Um, and pretty much all of us, at one time or another, are going to experience disability. We have an injury, we have surgery, something happens, and we really kind of life sucks. I mean, disability feels terrible. But if you are, say, someone who uses a wheelchair for mobility, and you're in an apartment or a home that's set up for someone with a wheelchair, and you have sidewalks that will get you places and transportation that can accommodate you. You can hold down a job, you can, you, basically, you don't experience a lot of disability. But that very same person, if you put them in a three-story walk-up, you know, needs two big guys to, to carry them up the stairs and put them on the toilet, and you experience total disability. So it's not just about your condition, it's about the supports you have around you. Any comments on that? Thoughts on that? Because I'm telling you something different than what you hear, and you still need to talk about disabilities, because like I said, that's how you access resources. So our communities are basically designed and constructed for the typical or average person. 
And um, I'm very big on environmental design as a way to manage behavior. Um, but uh, how many of you have um, have problem going out into some of these places, or you have kids who have problems going to some of the regular community spaces? Anybody? I'm going to try to get you all talking to me too, because you're going to you're going to fall asleep if I talk for two hours. But you have your hand up. You all are experts, okay? You all are experts in your own right because you have been dealing from the time your child was a baby and still maybe for many of you with executive functioning issues. Um, and uh, so, so were you gonna say something about? Yep. Yeah, sure, an example. So taking your shopping, it's a big deal, right? Which means that either you do less shopping or she has to get left behind and she doesn't get the experience of shopping, so she doesn't get to learn from that. But the reality is I got some pictures later that are uh, actually pretty soon. So typical development is accommodated in a typical environment. So if you have a little kid, we expect that they're not gonna have executive functioning skills. And uh, you know, the, the shopping carts they have little places to put your little kids. But if that's a 10 year old, that's a different story. But you may still wish you had a shopping cart that the kid could sit in. So because they don't have the impulse control that you would need them to do in order to get through a shopping trip. Um, So I do ask, has anybody noticed, has anybody thought about what they would like to have out in their communities that they do not? That would make it easier? Oh. I don't know, I might, I might stick with a computer. I'll mess that one up. No, uh, I, I, I know some folks that I've worked with um, where the person is incontinent, for instance, there's changing tables in every restroom, but not for someone bigger than a baby. And so that becomes a real problem, those kinds of issues. There are a lot of things in our community that are set up for the average family, but if, if you have a non-average family member, um, it presents a lot, less, a lot of problems for you in terms of convenience sometimes, and even in terms of your being able to go out and participate in the community the way you would like to. So um, something I think you're really not dealing with here, but I deal with a lot with the people who, who are calling me to kind of fill in the gaps um, in the service system. And what I've seen is that there is a tendency in a lot of school systems to segregate kids with special needs entirely away from the main population. I, I, I think from what I'm hearing, that's not so common in Falls Church and honestly, there are some kids where you just you just have to do that. <laughs> you have to get them away because it's going to be too stimulating otherwise. Um, but I did want to point out that there, there are some downsides to that contained classroom. Your child might function better at school, but it does segregate them from their typical peers. Um, it usually later on, you know, in elementary and middle school, they may not be that aware of that, but by the time they get into high school, they realize they're different and they don't want to be and, they, and they're trying to move towards their peers and it can be um, it can be difficult for the kid. Um, you also get reduced normative experience in learning and, and, and that's true even in like the shopping situation. There are a lot of folks I work with who they don't get taken out to shopping malls because they're just too much, they're too difficult to manage basically unless you've got some professional supports. Those professional supports are not always easy to access. Um, and so I'm just gonna kind of let that li list speak for itself. Um, the atypical restrictions and negative consequences I wanna talk about. Well, one, if you have a lot more adults with those kids, you're gonna get more power struggles between the adults and the kids. And uh, I, I want a picture, I wanna show you a picture of 
typical high schoolers. Now, this is older probably than your kid, if, if, your, if your child is here. But. So what do you think? Is this not a picture of positive social interaction and positive? What were they doing five minutes ago? Do you trust them? We don't really know what they were doing five minutes ago, but they might not have been doing what they were supposed to do. Okay, what I'm going to tell you is your kid with executive functioning problems is the kid who gets caught. And especially if there's more staffing around and more teachers around, they're much more likely to get caught because they don't plan ahead and think about how to avoid getting caught. And so a lot of times kids with special support needs end up actually experiencing a lot more punishment, discipline, lectures, things like that than their peers who are actually not behaving better, but they're better at not getting caught. Just kind of want to throw that out there. Um, and I want to address the, the, the concept quickly of being person-centered. Um, sounds like you have some really good teams operating here, but a lot of people talk about being person-centered in their work. And all the systems say, well, we want you to be person-centered. But this is kind of my picture of a person and all the things that are kind of pushing that person in one way or another and teaching that person and all the internal factors that affect that person. And when you just take a look at that, it's actually very complicated being person-centered. You have to get to know the person well. You have to get to know the person well. And uh, sometimes that's difficult. Sometimes it's not funded for someone to spend the time necessary to get to know your kid really well. Um, but I want to bring that up because everybody talks about being person-centered. Everybody says they're person-centered, but a lot of times, especially when you get into the older system and when you get into the adult system, decisions are made about placement and things like that all around the system and what the system happens to have and you know whether it's a good fit or not. Um, it's not really, those services are often not adapted to the specific child. And because of that, they're often not terribly effective. I'm a big believer in being person-centered, um, especially if someone has barriers to learning already or barriers to function. <laughs> so I'm not going to tell you a lot about the science, because I'm really here to, I'm a practitioner. And I've been a scholar at some points, but when you're a practitioner, it's a struggle to keep up with the literature in the field and such. Um, but I work with a lot of families. So anybody know where in that brain those executive functions are going to be located? The prefrontal frontal area, um, really right behind the eyes. And you almost have to think of that as kind of the place that all information goes through coming in and goes through coming out. Only sometimes not all the information that you would think was coming in is coming in. And sometimes the information that should be feeding into that decision-making process isn't coming in. So a kid who really doesn't, per doesn't perceive safety issues, doesn't look to see if a car is coming, that kind of thing, their, their prefrontal area is not processing that information and they're making decisions without, without that information. Sometimes we assume that people have information in their brains that's coming through and informing their decisions when that's not really true. And sometimes we think kids are making choices when they do not experience it that way. They don't experience it as a choice. And they sometimes don't really understand what happened or what went wrong. <coughs> So there are a lot of factors impacting brain and behavior. Um, you know, the principal ones we usually look at are the environmental stimuli, the environmental response, motivational status, and uh, to some degree social modeling are ones that typically a uh, uh, behavioral professional will be looking at all those things. Um, and some behavioral professionals are looking at these other things. But there's a lot of things that can impact What's, what's going on in the brain, what's going on with the executive functions. So, uh, you, you know, if you do research, you find people not all defining things the same way. 
but I think there's a pretty good consensus on what key features, key executive functions are. And uh, so number one is awareness, uh, which the definition I found age appropriate insight regarding strengths and weaknesses, perception of the meaning and importance of specific stimuli implications for behavior. Anyway, awareness. How many of you have kids who seem oblivious to things that we think are important sometimes? Like most of you, right? If, if, if they're executive function problems, you know, you're really worried about safety. Um, you're worried about judgment. You're worried about social judgment. You're worried about vulnerability. A lot of times the supervision is because we know that not everybody out there is nice and that there are people who will take advantage. And especially as kids get older, I guess your kids are all in middle school, as they get into high school, they're gonna experience that same desire to be off on their own, you know, at the mall with their friends, only you may not be able to allow that because they, they may get themselves in serious trouble and their friends might get them in serious trouble too because there is a tendency for peers to exploit someone if they can. I mean, you know, kids can be different. Kids can be kind of mean to each other. Self-initiation. So initiating um, really new activities on your own. And uh, a lot of kids I work with, they actually will initiate new activities on their own, but it's, it, it's, it's a little bit random. But I, I do work with quite a few people who, uh, who basically wait for a prompt. Anybody here experience prompt dependence? It's not as big a thing with younger kids, but where the kid begins to, even when they know how to do something, they're gonna wait till they're prompted to do it or it won't get done. And, and there, there are strategies for getting past that, and we'll be talking about that. Um, and then, then, then a big one, self-inhibition. Um, and that's really a lot about impulse control, but it's also about um, not paying attention to the wrong things. I think uh, there was not so long ago research done um, where they tracked eye movements of folks who were uh, on the autism spectrum and compared that to kids who were considered typical. And what they found is they were not looking at the same things. That actually, you know, when you walk into this room and someone else walks into this room, you think you're all looking at the same thing. But actually, one person might be noticing signs and things over there in the camera, and someone else might be focused over here, and someone else might be focused here. All of us have to filter out a lot of stimuli in order to focus on the important parts of the situation. And uh, that can be very difficult. I mean, that's an executive function, is the ability to do that. So um, not surprisingly, you, you get kids who can't filter it out, and they're kind of responding to whatever they happen to see first, and that, that, that kind of thing. And they, and they have trouble inhibiting themselves. Anybody here have a kid who doesn't really get the concept of uh, taking something from someone else? Yeah, and and just will look at you like, what's wrong with you? When, when they do that, you try to correct them. Um, I, I work with a few people like that uh, right now. So, um, you know, something that I missed that I wanted to uh, bring up was that notion about making accommodations and normal accommodations running around. I used to be a preschool teacher for about six years before I went back to graduate school. And I found in my last few years, I was, in a, uh, I was directing a cooperative nursery school and I had parents in the classroom learning, learning what happens in the block corner and how to manage other kids and stuff. It was really a pretty awesome experience um, but I was able, because it was in a nice church building and we weren't competing for space, um, I could put gross motor equipment out in the hallway and set up quiet spaces where people could do quiet things. Basically, was able to arrange an environment in which whatever the kid wanted to do, there, it was not a discipline problem. And so we really had no problems in that preschool around executive functioning because the environment was arranged so the kid who's really hyper to go out, out and uh, play on the, on the large motor equipment and we just come back and when we got a chance, we redirect him back and do a little more of our agenda and he'd be back out there. But there was no discipline around it. There was no any, anybody doing anything wrong. I have to say, and th this was in Maryland, that uh, 
when those kids went into first and second grade, a, a significant portion turned out with disabilities because they couldn't sit for an hour um, and just listen to somebody, which was actually expected in some of the schools and uh, honestly isn't really developmentally appropriate at that age, but it, it is the way we tend to do things. And so um, what I saw in that instance was that, uh, again, the disability, there was no disability in my classroom, but some of those kids were disabled when they my, left my classroom and went to one in which running around or doing something, um, you know, self-initiating basically would, would get, no, you need to come over here and do this. And, you know, and so all of a sudden they were being bad and they just hadn't experienced that. It made me wonder, gee, maybe should, I should have, I should have done something to prepare them better for what would come later, but I don't think so. Um, so some more key executive functions, planning. How many of you have kids who really plan ahead of time and think ahead of time? Nobody's, nobody's gonna, their kids don't think ahead of time? Yeah. The planning is actually a big issue. And I gotta say, um, you know, when we come to interventions, I'm always looking at help, helping people to plan their time and activities. But if you don't know what's coming next, your anxiety levels get very high, and you respond to whatever is going on around you, and then when whatever is coming next comes, it's interrupting whatever it is you're doing, which was unplanned to begin with, and it, then you get into power struggles and all kinds of different things. Um, but we, we will talk more about that Goal setting, which is a, a, a relatively advanced one in some ways, but you know, even um, you know, even a lot of toddlers, you'll watch them; they're goal directed. You can see what they're trying to do, and they're really going at it. And uh, one of the things that I think is really helpful is to actually tune in on their goals. We tend to tune in on our goals for our kids, what we want them to do. But the, sometimes the best way to do that is to tune into their goals and say, oh, I see you were trying to do that. Great job, you got it. And uh, it's really, really helpful, and it's relationship building. Um, and, uh, and it also builds up their sense of mastery. And mastery learning is, I think, is a very um, powerful form of human learning. The self-monitoring is pretty important. Now, that's pretty advanced. I have a lot of friends who don't really do that too well. Um, and uh, but if you can actually assess what you've done and respond and make changes, that means you're learning from the feedback the environment's giving you. And that's a really important piece. If someone's not doing that self-monitoring, they're not learning at the same level from their daily experiences in different places um, because they aren't, they aren't thinking, oh, well, maybe if I do this differently, or maybe they often get stuck and they really sometimes need, need other folks to help them out. And say, you know, there's other options here. Anybody here have a kid who kind of gets to right the edge of the point of a tantrum because it's like, I'm trying to do this and I can't do this. And it's like, have you thought about trying a, a different way? And it's like, oh, hmm. And a lot of the work that we do is helping kids learn how to problem solve instead of freak out. Because most of those meltdowns are when someone experiences a problem that they just feel like, I'm never going to get through this. And, uh, and of course, most problems can be resolved. A few more, the ability to change sets. Some of you may see this. It, it results in kind of rigid behavior. It results in like, we're gonna go do this at 10 o'clock and then at 10 o'clock, something happens. Or, you know, the kids are looking forward to school. Snow, school is closed. Anybody here get some behavioral reactions when things don't go as planned? Where they're actually kind of They've got the plan, but what they can't do is let go of it into another kind of situation. So one of the things that I'm gonna do at the end of this is we're gonna, the last three pages of, of um, what I'm, or three slides of what I'm presenting is we're really gonna go over those in some detail and I'm gonna make y'all talk to me some about what you're experiencing. Um, but we'll also share, I'm gonna be looking to you to be able to share some of your experiences and questions like, if this and this and this happens, how would you try to deal with it? Um,
So what you need executive functions for, you need it for effective planning and decision making. You need it for correcting your errors and problem solving and troubleshooting. You need it where you're, you're, you need to do something that isn't well rehearsed, something you've not done before. You have to come up with a new solution um, and a new set of actions. Um, it, it's about what you need in order to perceive and respond to dangerous or complex um, situations. And like your average shopping mall or your average street corner is actually pretty complex. There's a lot of things you have to pay attention to to, to be safe. Um, and, and it's needed when a typical or habitual response must be inhibited. So if you've got a kid who really likes food, um, they might, as they're walking by, grab someone else's donut if you're not careful. And, uh, and it's because they can't inhibit. So again, something important though, sometimes you say that kid made a choice and they don't really experience it that way. They're just reacting to what's around them. And that's kind of, when, when your executive functioning isn't working right, you're really just kind of reacting to what's in front of you. Or sometimes what happened, what happened recently, but you're not, it's not, it's not a very functional response. And you don't get, get to do much problem solving. So what I want to look at is some of the things that can go wrong. Some of the things that undermine um, the development of, of those functions. And uh, what, what I'd like to say is um, it really is important what's going wrong in order for you to fix it. You kind of want to figure it out because the fix is going to depend what's going wrong. Is it going wrong on the input level as information is coming at, in? I mean, is a person just simply not looking to see if a car is coming? Because then you want to teach those kinds of skills. Or is it because the person is looking but then they lose track of it and that you know there are different kinds of approaches you may want to use so some of the potential problems around development um executive functions develop from zero to you know full adult executive functioning um by about the age of 23 but anything that creates a developmental delay can delay the development of executive functioning. And so we, and, and it's, uh, as a kid gets older, it becomes more of a disability when they have that delay. For instance, a, a, a toddler who has a meltdown, nobody blinks twice. Toddlers have meltdowns. You know, a 12 year old who has a meltdown, a little more of a problem. People are calling police, you know, I uh, don't know if any of you use, any of you have experienced that, but some families, they, they're getting a hard time from their neighbor and people are checking out, are they abusing their child, that kind of thing. Um, I, my, youngest, my youngest son actually, uh, he, he, he figured it out. He, he learned that if he started screaming out the window, that really pushed our buttons. Because we did have some neighbors who would like call police and it was like, what are you doing to him? It's like, we're not doing anything. He just didn't want to go to bed. <laughs> Um, so um, the physical environment, and this is where you really want to think about the physical environment because it can be a setup. It's like a place like this to your kid without much executive functioning. This is a runway or a football field. If they see this visually, they are going to respond to it by running and getting very stimulated and hyper and then sometimes losing behavioral control um, as a function of that overstimulation. Um, and so as a preschool teacher, I really learned a lot about um, arranging your room. And any teacher um, worth their salt knows about arranging their room. They want to get in there. They want to get their room right. They want to get their materials right um, so, that, so that what they're presenting is going to be leading the kids in the direction that they want to take them. Um, on the perceptual level, there's, any, there's a number of things that can go wrong. I mean, if someone has sensory issues or actually doesn't see very well or hear very well, or now, now we're pretty good at screening out those kinds of just more purely physical ones. But we have a lot of folks who um, don't respond well to, to loud noise, to certain lights or bright lights, to open spaces. It's, it's a kind of an individual thing. Um, I'll, I'll give you an example here. My uh, 
My wife sometimes comes home and I, I, I told you I'm an ex-preschool teacher. I can tolerate noise. I can tolerate a lot of noise. I don't really hear it. I filter it out. My wife comes home and a radio is on, the TV is on, and I'm doing something else. And uh, she doesn't have a meltdown, but let me just say that, that she has a reaction to it. And, uh, and so people really differ with, with what they can tolerate. If we went around this room, we'd find some people who were good with being touched, some people who didn't want anybody to touch them, some people who only wanted certain people to touch them and only when they knew it was coming, and other people who just want hugs from anybody. I'm sure we find all of those in this room. Those are all sensory issues to some degree, and they're also kind of family culture issues to some degree. Uh, there's a lot that goes into it. Um, but, you know, a little kid, a, a, a six-year-old who wants to hug everybody, not a problem. 13, 14 year old who wants to hug everybody, mm, we're getting into a different territory there, right? I've seen kids suspended for trying to hug another kid, you know, in high school. Um, and uh, I, I will say, although it's not the topic, language skill plays a lot into all of this because language is used internally also for inhibition. And uh, if you have anybody in your family who does self-talk, I'll, I'll, I'll give a little example of, of something that was uh, kind of humorous and kind of sad. A kid, um, I got called in, he had been suspended from school and uh, he had three sisters, all of whom were, were very attractive in their late teens. And uh, he was the youngest and he had been taught not to stare at women's chests. And, uh, but there was someone who was interested in school and I think actually it was a young teacher and he started self-talk. He's like, don't look at the chest, don't look at the chest, don't look at the chest, don't be creepy, which was his sister's voice, I think. And, and he got suspended, you know? And he was trying, actually, to stop himself from being inappropriate. He was trying to inhibit himself. And that's a lot of times with the self-talk, you may hear that. It's about self-inhibition, and, but, some, some folks just can't keep it in their head. Most of us, at some point, did that same kind of self-talk, usually between the ages of about three and seven or eight, um, or two and seven or eight, um, depending how early people start really talking. Um, but, but that self-talk, I could, I could make you all start to do that self-talk. It's like, it's, it's a very developmentally natural phase, but when there's developmental delay. So sometimes the big problem is, how things are interpreted by the surrounding social environment and not really about the person. Because a lot of times a person really meant no harm of any sort and, and, uh, and self-talk gets a lot of people in trouble. <laughs> quite, a, quite a few cases where basically they're exposing their thinking and it sounds really weird, especially like when you get a high schooler or older and, and they start saying weird things that people react very badly. Um, and then genetics brain structure. Um, there are some genetic conditions that are just associated with limited development of those executive functions and that part of the brain. Um, and um, there are also a lot of conditions one can get that can, that can really depress or suppress those executive functions or mess with them. Um, and we'll talk a little bit more about that in a bit. Me a message here. I have to say okay, or it won't let me proceed. Um, one of the things that I've been working with uh, a lot recently, because the even the physicians don't have a very good grasp of it, is some neurological conditions actually can kind of um, really mess up the brain functioning and crosswire things and such. Um, so I, I, th these are situations I've worked, I've worked with a lot of people with seizures um, where even though the seizures are stopped, there's actually some random activity going on. It doesn't amount to a seizure, but it actually can impact behavior and you can see some things happen as a function of that seizure activity. Uh, anybody heard of pandas before? Um, work, worked with a couple of folks where that became a really serious um, issue, caused a lot of serious compulsiveness and all, a whole set of symptoms. Not well 
understood or accepted by the local med medical communities and hospitals. People with that have trouble getting medical care. Um, although there are recommendations and such, it's all, it's all controversial. Well, all right. Um, and uh, has anybody here heard much about Lyme disease? Because you actually want to keep your eye out for those sticks and, and monitor your kids carefully. Some people react very, very badly to Lyme disease and don't throw it when they're treated um, or sometimes don't get treated and, and you don't know it. And I'm working, I've, I've worked with a couple of people who, who experience serious neurological problems around Lyme disease. And it's, Lyme disease is becoming much more common in this area. Uh, but again, it's like pandas, it's not recognized by a lot of the local physicians and they won't do the tests to find out, especially if you have something called psychiatric Lyme disease, which, which means you, you've been treated and everything, but you start to have psychiatric symptoms that can mimic almost anything. Um, and I think it's a form of brain inflammation, but honestly, I don't think our doctors know how to image whatever is occurring, but I've worked with some people who are just totally, totally debil debilitated and nobody can figure out why, and they think it's related to the Lyme, but who knows? Don't mean to scare y'all. It's, it's a relatively rare kind of thing, but um, I'll tell you, if I, I've, gotten, I've gotten bit by Lyme ticks and shown signs of Lyme a couple of times. I got the most aggressive treatment I could. I would recommend that. Um, Does everybody have a handout? It's very little and it's not in color. Okay. <laughs> Yeah, put the computer to sleep here. Um, we talk about sensory. All right, so now we're down to what, what so what is a family to do? And, and, and this is the point where we're gonna be, I'm gonna be looking for, for some solutions that you all have found because you all have addressed some of these issues at home and have found your own ways. I know some tricks, but some of you probably know some that I don't know. Um, but I would say the first thing is, do no harm. <laughs> because a lot of times it's a, as a parent, or as a teacher, as someone working with a kid who's having trouble meeting your goals and expectations, it's easy to get frustrated. Um, we live in a culture of punishment, you do something wrong, it's like you should be punished because you did something wrong. Um, and it looks like, uh, oh good, we're gonna have that back. No, you got it back. Thank you. Um, so, so punishment is a typical response, but it is not for kids with executive functioning problems. It is usually not a great idea. How many here have found that, that punishment really doesn't work with your kid, that it actually makes the behavior worse? Yeah. And, and, and it, that's not always the case, but as, as a professional, I just, I don't use any form of punishment now because there's always a chance that I'll make matters worse rather than better. Um, one thing you all need to do as family members is let yourselves off the hook because your kids know how to press all your buttons. And so you probably are, you're gonna have your meltdowns and you're gonna get mad sometimes. And so you just gotta, but, but what you wanna do is kind of be mindful about it. You know, if you overreact sometime, you just need to know that you overreacted. And actually, it never hurts to come back and apologize to a kid later and say, you know what? I went a little too far there. I kind of lost it. They understand about losing it, don't they? Right? So, so that's not hard for them to understand. Um, and uh, one of the things that, that I just observed is that, that most of the kids I deal with with, with um, executive functioning problems they have gone through a lot of punishment and they'd be model citizens if that was working with them so punishment is something actually i think i have another slide on uh, yeah so let me i'll wait for that other slide um but a lot of the um a lot of the very worst behavioral incidents occur in the context of social punishment anybody have like a preteen 
Who has a phone? Try to take it away. What kind of reaction do you get? Meltdown. So, so I, I'm a big believer that, that you don't make behavior worse in order to make it better. And yet, as a parent, you're like, what leverage do I have? <laughs> you know, there's not much. But, but um, one of the things that, that, that uh, you know, I, I worked with one family who, who dealt with um, their, their child in, in high school. At some point, got an opportunity to go through. He picked up a lot of things that didn't belong to him. He, it wasn't like he was going to sell them or do anything. It was just he was interested, and he, he brought them home. And, and as a response, they took all his possessions away to make him earn it back. Um, I, and what I would say is that you, you are actually, you think you're punishing the taking things from others. But what you're actually doing is modeling taking things from others. And if you take away something that belongs to your kid, it means it didn't belong to your kid, right? So, and th this becomes a huge thing in, later in teens. I mean, honestly, it's probably the number one thing I hear about violent behavior is when a parent tries to take their kid's phone away or some other thing. And sometimes for some of those kids, that is their social network. They don't really have a peer network in reality, but they have a virtual peer network and it meets a lot of their needs. And you take that phone away and they're they're crushed. Their life is over. And they get really, <laughs> they really lose it. Um, and so uh, you want to think about the fact, basically what I would say is, um, oh, I, yeah, I don't want to miss this. I'm going to talk more about punishment in a second. Um, understand the difference between bribery and reinforcement. Who, who here can tell me the difference between bribery and reinforcement? Right, and how is that different from earning? A lot of time we do bribery and call it earning. And and there are ways to earn it, but you know, to do earning, but earning then it's an entitlement. Bribery is I mean actually you bribery is very effective, which is why people go to it. It's like <laughs> you go here and look, look, I, I got a headache if you if you don't scream for the next hour. You know, you can have this ice cream or something. And the kid's like, hmm. Actually, I'll tell a story about potty training, my youngest one. I mean, I was a preschool teacher, background in psychology, and but uh, my youngest one did not want to sit on the potty. And he was getting close to three, and at that time there were no nursery schools around that would take a kid who, who was in diapers. And uh, so at one point, I was just like, look, you sit on the potty, I'll give you a cookie. And he looks at me like, oh, well, an interesting idea. Yeah. And he sits down on the potty. Of course, he doesn't do anything. But he sits on the potty for like a, two minutes or whatever it was. And I give him a cookie. And we do that about three times. And I'm thinking, oh, I'm making progress here. We got him sitting on the potty now. And then I go, and it's like, yeah, why don't you? I'll give you a cookie. You sit on the potty. And he looks at me and says, two cookies. Because bribery leads to extortion, <laughs> almost inevitably. And he's sitting there saying, OK, this potty thing, I got leverage now. <laughs> I can get something out of him for this. And then when I said, no, your mother, you know, you we're about to have dinner. Your mother would kill me if I give you. And he picks up the potty and throws it at me. So now we have aggressive and property destructive behavior, you know, on top of noncompliance and all this other stuff. And it's like. Then I kind of be, am beating my own head on the wall. It's like, I know about bribery. I know it doesn't work. Sometimes, actually, most behaviors won't say this, but sometimes it's worth a bribe just to get something started. But don't stick with the bribery. So, so but like, if I come in and, 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 and I say, you know, um, if you don't scream for the next hour, I'm going to give you a stick of gum. And it works really well. And I do that, like, 12 days in a row. And I've got, you know, I can take data. I'm a behaviorist, so I've got all these zeros. No screaming, no screaming, no screaming. But the day that I don't bring that stick of gum, you're not only going to scream, you're going to remind me that you're entitled to that gum. You're going to throw something at me or, you know, escalate further. So bribery actually keeps behaviors alive because 
even someone whose executive functioning isn't working that well can put together that in order to elicit this bribe, I have to maintain this behavior. I have to keep it at the ready. So I mean, I, I, I know one family, I, yeah, go ahead. When, what, if you know first, the, then that, is that still bribing? Um, not necessarily, not necessarily. But if, if I, I think, if you're asking someone not to do something and you're going to pay them for it, then they are never going to forget that that's something that they have over you. And when they want something from you, they'll remind you uh, about that behavior. But no, so if, if then on a broader level can be a planning strategy that's actually very helpful to some kids. So you'll see a lot of kids, um, if they have a visual schedule or a schedule in the classroom where the teacher will be saying, you know, first we're going to do this and then we're going to do that. And, and kind of, but it's more about scheduling and planning than it is about trying to change their behavior directly by bribing them. Well, the reason I'm asking is because they usually have verses and non-preferred activities, then the second, which is the preferred activity. So in a way, it's the kid would do it because he knows he's getting something. And mm -hmm. probably something he would do on it. That's sometimes referred to as critical scheduling, and it's, it, it's, a, it's a very effective technique, but you don't talk about it, if you do this, then, you, then, then I'll let you do this, that would be bribery, but if you just say, you know, if they don't want to do it, and they're, they're requesting the good thing. So, so let's say if it was me, um, let's say I didn't like showering, and I hadn't taken my shower, and the next thing on my schedule was mowing the lawn which I really hate, okay? You're never getting me into that shower because I know what's coming next. Whereas if you've got a nice snack for me after I finish my shower, then I'm gonna get in that shower and get that shower done so I can get my, you know, and it's not even conscious to get my snack, but it's more like I got something to look forward to. Um, and so a lot of times that's referred to as critical scheduling. It's a good idea. And um, when someone gets to a task that they don't like, and then gets to a task they do, it actually reinforces performance on that other task usually. So it's so it's actually a pretty sound strategy. Um, but it you know, and some things are kind of on the edge of of is this bribery or isn't this bribery? But keep an eye on that. I've seen some families that thought they had reinforcement systems in place. They were bribery systems, and the behavior was deteriorating over time from their kids and. Uh, and then they double down on the bribery and offer bigger. Yeah. Is, um, is the concept of, of catching them being good a reinforcement thing? It's, it's actually a, a critically important strategy. I haven't gotten to the strategy so much yet, but actually that's the hardest thing. I'll, I'll go ahead with this because some of the hardest thing, especially if you have a kid who's really energetic, you know, when they're behaving themselves well, you take a break because you're exhausted trying to keep things from happening. Unfortunately, what that means is when they're being at their best, they're getting no attention from you around it. And so it's kind of self-defeating. So sometimes I'm working with families, look, I know it's hard, I know you're exhausted, but make sure you pay attention. If not now, at, you know, in an hour, go back and say, you know what? That was the most restful time I had. Thank you so much. I really appreciate it. It was real peaceful in here. And, uh, and so that you can still reinforce it later. I, you know, a lot of people say that reinforcement has to happen right after a behavior. Um, I think that is true for some people. But I've found that actually uh, a lot of folks I work with have actually pretty good memories of what happened. And, and you can come back to it later and discuss it and debrief usually what you don't want to do if they've misbehaved you don't want to talk about it right then and there um and and i'll talk a little more about that but but that's really for a lot of the folks with executive functioning problems if they also have language problems when you try to lecture them with the idea of improving their behavior the message doesn't come through but the attention does and so you end up actually rewarding the very behavior you're trying to get them to not do and so what I would say is that, that the off, you really want, um, you want a delayed response. If you need to debrief, usually if your kid's just acted out, their adrenaline levels and cortisol levels are really high, 
They, you know, they can't process stuff. Once you go into behavioral crisis, your brain is really flooded with, with, with um, all these chemicals, and it pretty much shuts down that part of the brain that has to do with executive functioning. And so um, I'll talk a little bit about, for instance, timeouts. Uh, I'll talk about uh, a family member who was raising kids, and, and I heard her as, as she was saying to um, her rather wayward and over-energetic four-year-old, do, you, do we need to give you a timeout? You know, it's being used punitively. I would advise against that because actually we all need to time ourselves out. And if you want to use timeout as a management strategy, one, you want to use it preventatively as early as you can when you see they're getting overstimulated. But the goal is not for them to just calm down in that moment, but for them to learn how to calm themselves down. And so, and if you make taking time out a punishment, then it's something they don't want to do. And really, I want them to do that. I want them, when they're gonna lose it, to go to their room for a few minutes, or go into the bathroom and deal with it, and then come back out, give some time for those chemicals to drain from their brains. Um, the problem is, as, as a parent, and believe me, I've been through this, and. Uh, Pretty much, if you're managing someone else who's going into crisis, you too are going into crisis. Your brain is getting flooded with cortisol and adrenaline, and your executive functions are starting to shut down. And if you ever want to you know, watch people or talk to people who are emergency responders, at one point I was. There was one point where um, I, was, I was involved in the day program. We were getting people directly out of long-term residential placement, um, and they were there because of behavior. And uh, when, when uh, basically, oh man, I'm losing that thought. Let me come back to that, let me come back to that. Um, let me get to the next, next slide, because I'm doing things out of sequence, and I'm, my executive function is getting messed up here. So, um, so I, I, I want to come back to the punishment. But yeah, I really want to deal with this. Because people think that negative consequences deter behavior, and they don't. It is anticipating the negative consequences that deters behavior. So when I don't really know how mortgages work, the first time I, I find that I'm getting paying extra money because I didn't pay my mortgage on time, that kind of thing, I, I get mad, I get, but, I, but I pay it. Um, but then the next time I'm paying it on time because I'm anticipating what's going to happen if I don't. And the reason, you know, aside from cultural reasons we go to punishment a lot, I think it's because it works really quickly when it works. Um, and so, and, and sometimes you do have to deliver negative consequences to get the person to anticipate those negative consequences. So I'm not totally anti-punishment, certainly not in the context of a family. As a professional, I find that it's, it's hazardous and not useful to me for the most part. I don't, I don't really need it as a professional. But family members, eh, you know, sometimes you gotta, it's a way of setting a limit, really. Um, and limit setting is important. Um, so, uh, but unfortunately for a lot of folks with executive functioning problems, because they're having those, they're not taking in information or they're acting before all that information gets to their brain. Um, a lot of times, those, those negative consequences actually just don't help. They just make the person mad. Anybody here remember the last time someone screamed at you, yelled at you, fined you? What was your emotion following that? Come on, it's not rocket science. Some, some of us feel ashamed or guilty, particularly some religious persuasions really focus on that, but, but usually afterwards, did someone back there put up their hand? Uh, angry. angry. Right, it usually ends up, punishment usually makes people mad. Now if they've got good executive functioning, they can sit on that being mad and not do anything about it. If they have poor executive functioning, they're gonna act on being mad. The other thing, that whole guilt and shame kind of thing, we're talking about self-esteem. Now, those behaviors don't use words like that, 
but but I, I, I think it's a useful concept um, because they, they really feel badly about themselves. And there's a plenty of research showing that when that happens, behavior does not get better, it gets worse. So you have to worry about lowering self-esteem. You don't want to make a very impulsive kid angry. That doesn't improve behavior. So um, it's something that we try to avoid. And what I would say is that when you use punishment at home, what you want to do is try not to have to deliver it. It's the delivery of punishment that actually can be destructive if it happens over and over, especially for the same reason. And uh, I, I put it kind of strongly that uh, socially punishing someone when they're incapable of meeting the expectations is really like spanking a baby for wedding. It's not that they've made a choice. It's they didn't really experience it as a choice, and they don't know how to fix it. And and basically, they're getting they're getting hurt by someone they care about often, um, and they don't really understand what to do about it. it, it you know, and uh, so so it ends up having some emotional and behavioral impact a little bit like abuse, to tell you the truth. Um, and uh, yeah. Yeah, let me stop there, because I've thrown a lot of stuff out there. Why don't I take some questions now? Because we have a fair amount of time. Um, it can. But when I say try not to deliver it, I'm not saying basically, I don't think you should threaten something you're not going to do. But you want to be careful about what you threaten. Because sometimes then you need to follow through on it. And it may actually, you know, when your kid is punished, when your kid is grounded, anybody here grounded their kid? Who's really grounded? <laughs> it's the adult that's grounded, right? It's, it's, it's not, uh, and, and, and so I often give escape routes. I often give, a, you know, like, okay, look, tell you what, you do this for me, we'll call it even, and we'll, we'll just move on. And those kinds of things. But it's like when you tell your kid, you know, you're not going anywhere for the next month. You don't really want to do that. Because you're going to have a really lousy month, and the behavior is going to be really bad during that month. And what you really want is someone to get back on track. I think a lot of times when people are losing it behaviorally because they don't have those executive functions in place, you don't want to dwell on history. You want to look at future. And it's like, OK, it happened. Let's learn what we can about it and just move on and not worry about it. You know, We all lose it. Your kids see you lose it. They know. Um, and so. I, I think you'd be pretty honest about it. Do, do we have some other questions that have come up? Yeah. I think if, um, if we were to implement some of the uh, things that we've suggested, and it So, so let me speak directly to that. I do a lot of in-home services. Um, some people think that that's, you know, that the office services are kind of cooler and more professional and stuff. But I got to tell you, if I'm in someone's home for an hour, I know so much more. They could have been coming to me in the office for months, and I wouldn't know what I know by being able to walk in there, and I wouldn't be able to get through the defenses because. What I find is that families, if you just observe, say, oh, I see that happen and that happen, then you know, they're like, oh, well, caught. You know, and, you, and now it's room for discussion, but it may not be something that will come up in an office session for a long time. But one of the things that I think is really critical for in-home services is that you are not there to impose your culture and values on the family. You are there to help that family develop the culture with their child. 
that, that they are comfortable with. We, we're actually trying, and we, it might involve helping the family to tweak their culture a little bit. So what I would do in a situation like that, if my family, family was really, you know, had grown up, punishment is what you do, punishment is what you do, I would just simply work with them on, you know, it may be fine sometimes, but what I'm hearing is that every time you do this, you get aggressive behavior. That's a lot worse than the whining or the, you know, the, the refusing to do something. And it's not a good idea to push someone into aggression um, from, from a, a lesser behavior. Because honestly, what brain science shows you is that the more you do something, the more you're likely to do something. Every time you, you do a particular behavior or action, the, all the associations get stronger, the, the neurologically, the little dendrites and everything get stronger, they make more connections. And so I'm a big believer in prevention. If I'm coming into a family where someone's been very aggressive, what I want to do is prevent that aggression for a substantial period of time because automatically the brain will start to move backwards so that aggression is no longer the default response. And as long as I can prevent that aggression, that person is then finding other ways to cope with certain kinds of stressors. But you're probably trying to take certain stressors off the table. Like I, I'll give you one stressor that's really common, um, goes into a lot of my behavior plans, um, telling a kid no. Anybody here find that when they tell their kid no, it's meltdown time? No, he just, he was done. Oh, he'll ignore you. Okay, some of our kids have really learned a lot about ignoring, which is which is what you're often told to do. You just ignore that behavior, and but you, it actually, I think you need to do more than ignore one behavior. You need to pay a lot of attention to a behavior that can replace it, because otherwise, it, it, it just doesn't work very well. Um, but 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 I think the word no. If you think about it, your average toddler has heard the word no. 10,000 times in his two, two, two and a half years, okay? It's a very primal thing. If you ask me for something and I just say no, you can feel a little shot of adrenaline going up into your head. It's like, now most of us can manage that. But, but that's what's happening because it's like, it, it, you know, they've heard it so often. It is, it is like the first word kids often hear um, on, that's at least geared towards them and it's stopping them from doing something they like what they want to do so it's like you know automatically a bad thing so there are a lot of ways to say no without saying no so that critical scheduling that we were talking about it's like you know your kid's supposed to take a bath and then they're going to do this uh and then they're going to go have a snack um and and what what you're letting them know is you know when they say okay i want a snack now i want a snack now you're saying of course you can have a snack, Just, uh, but first the bath. But the, the word is never, no doesn't come up. It's like, yes, of course you can. It's a yes, but. Now, when your kids get older, you know, and you have to be a little more cautious because they, they, they begin to understand that trick. And it, I gotta tell you, don't try it on your spouse. <laughs> <laughs> um, my wife's in mental health and uh, I, I, I'm more behavioral in perspective, and uh, but if I try to use any of my te techniques on her, she knows what I'm doing right away. And, and, and you'll see that with, with especially teenagers too. They'll begin to resist things that work. Um, one of the things you need to know is that what worked in elementary school may not work for the same thing in middle school and almost certainly won't work when, when they're into adolescence. You, you need to find some different approaches because developmentally, that there's different things going on. Well, you know, it might be okay if it works. But if it doesn't work, and now you're the one getting hit, which sometimes is what happens, um, the target just shifts. Um, I, I, I think um, we're about to come to 
strategies for fixing things, and I think there's a lot of resources in this room. I've been talking more than I intended to, but when we come to this next stuff, I, I want to hear some stuff from you, because you all have, have come up with solutions in your own homes for some of the situations you deal with. And it's hard, especially when someone else is, is like when it's a sibling or things like that, you may have to structure things in a certain way. You really want to kind of prevent that to the degree you can, but you also want to consider that it is developmentally normal for siblings to hit each other. And, <laughs> and so what, what, what you don't want to, because a lot of times it's part of that whole stigma thing, well, if you do it, it's really bad. I, mean, I got to tell you, my kids never ended up with that with, with, with a label, but that doesn't mean, especially my younger one, didn't do some things. But he mostly didn't get mostly didn't get caught. But um, so, but in terms of dealing with with behaviors that are resulting from that lack of executive functioning, there are really three different kinds of approaches that everything kind of breaks down into. One is crisis prevention, which is where I put a huge, huge emphasis, but also behavior development and skills training. A lot of times, if you want a kid to, to not use one method, you've got to help them learn another method in, to, to, to do it. So you want you figure out what function, like is, is he doing that to get behave, to get attention? Well, then let's find some ways to actually schedule attention. I mean, I, uh, uh, now this is something I'll talk more about later, but for instance, attention is a need and a want, okay? Some kids need a lot of attention. Some kids need some attention, but want a lot of attention. For the most part, behaviorally, what you need to do is meet the needs, not the wants. Um, and, and so, but it's very important to determine, like, like if your kid seems to need some social interaction with you, like about every 15 minutes, Schedule it in your day when you're with them and let other people know, don't, don't let a half hour go by where you haven't got the attention because all of a sudden then you're getting attention seeking behaviors, which can be, but you know, your kid has a plan for you. It's like, I want this. It's like, no, I want this. And they'll try to yell and that doesn't work. All right, watch this. I want this. They, they, they have our numbers and they will escalate to the point that they, I, I'm, I'm, actually it wasn't a family I was working with, it was a, a friend who, um, they were getting into a pattern with their toddler of, he, he'd had a tantrum for two hours, and when he was calm for five minutes, they'd take him to Toys R Us to reward him for calmness, okay? Can you see where that would go wrong? So he learned not only he learned not only were tantrums effective, but that he learned how to persist with a tantrum for a very, very long time, and he knew he could outlast his parents. So one thing I will say, if you're gonna cave, cave early. Okay, because otherwise, <laughs> otherwise you are really reinforcing a persistence you don't wanna reinforce. That one, that one resonated with some people there. Um, So, and I'm not going to. I'm not going to actually talk about behavior crisis management. And the reason I'm not going to talk about it is there really is not a therapeutic piece to management in most cases. Even though that initially in our field, in my field, a lot of emphasis was around how do you manage behaviors when they occur. But the fact is, about the best you can do most of the time is not reinforce the behavior but lectures and punishment and all those different things that we do immediately following a behavior to manage, them, to manage it. Um, you know, what I would say is management, you do as, as little as you need to to make sure things are safe and legal and, and don't spend a lot of time talking right afterwards. So, I mean, you can come back to it later on when the person's calm and you can have a rational discussion if your kid is verbal. But um, but th there aren't, I mean, I do believe there's such a thing as therapeutic holding because that was something that I had to do with, as we were getting folks out of institutions. I mean, they were just coming out and melting down and sometimes getting very violent. And what they needed to know was you were not fighting them. You were just trying to help them stay in control. Um,
But that's hard to do because believe me, your adrenaline is pumping when it gets to that kind of situation. Uh, so um, before we go into kind of remedies on, on dealing with executive function related behavior, um, I want to talk a little bit about, see that little figure up at the top there? That, that, that's what's sometimes referred to as a crisis cycle. And uh, you can't really read it too well from here. But the idea is that someone's going along, they got a certain amount of cortisol or adrenaline in your brain all the time. But then something happens in the environment that triggers a reaction and it starts to pump more chemicals into the brain. Might be there's a real loud noise, might be mom said no, might be they've been asked to do something they don't want to do, but whatever the trigger is, it's starting to actually pump stuff into their brain. And at a certain point, they're gonna lose the capacity for executive functioning. You want to try to intervene as early as you can because once they've reached that point, you're just into management. Um, what I will say is that sometimes when you manage a meltdown and, and you get the person all calmed down afterwards, for instance, like you sit and you have a cup of tea and everything, you, you gotta be aware that Gee, am I reinforcing that behavior by not having this cozy little talk right after? What you, what you should take away from that is, you know what? Sitting down and having a cozy conversation with a cup of tea can happen before the crisis rather than after the crisis. And if you do it before the crisis, you won't have the crisis. I mean, literally, I've worked with folks who that's what it was, is, is that in order to have something they wanted, they had to misbehave. And most folks will misbehave if, if that's the case. So, so my kid is still in reading book. And two, two, three, four days, he has blinking and reminds me to get up, breathe, so when the kid is doing mm -hmm. it. Am I reinforcing the picture by doing that? Or? Um, no, but what I would say is that direction to breathe should come before the person's in full crisis. But, but because that's when you want to do the breathing. That's where most of us, say if we're in a workplace and we're really mad at our boss and we're a little afraid we're going to have a meltdown, it's like, I just need to go to the bathroom for a minute. You, know, <laughs> you try to calm down, let some of those chemicals wash out of your brain so you don't lose control, that kind of thing. Um, I think that, uh, I think that um, your kid is really helped by taking things that help afterwards and putting them beforehand. I often, often what we do is we do charts for, when we didn't know folks and we were taking, we were having some really rough behaviors and stuff, we do little charts and try to figure out what the triggers were. And then when we found that we were giving things, to, doing things to help them calm down that worked, we were like, so how do we get it earlier? Sometimes it's a sensory issue. We found out that a lot of people who were getting restrained really needed some deep pressure. It was a sensory thing, and they needed social touch. And by then scheduling, like about every 10, 15 minutes, make sure you're given a high five, that met the sensory need, and the restraints just stopped. You didn't need to do it anymore. Because they didn't like being restrained, but they had a need for that touch. And I, I remember there was one preschooler I worked, worked with the family, and I just observed that the whole time that she was, <laughs> Her mother was overwhelmed because <laughs> she was all over her mother, and if she tried to answer the phone, she'd be getting pinched and scratched and all kinds of things. But what I noticed was a lot of it was to get some kind of physical contact. And so we just started making sure we gave her physical contact like every five minutes. Behavior disappeared. The, the, the school was having a horrible time. She was turned over tables. This is a three-year-old. And, uh, and they had a no ha hands-off policy, which I think for a three-year-old is kind of weird, but, um, but, but when we went to the school and say, look, the behavior plan calls for you to be giving her social touch like every five to 10 minutes. They did it, all the behaviors disappeared. And, and so sometimes even just one little thing like that can drive behavior if a need is not being met. Um, so it's worth looking at. Um, and uh, something you want to know is that the, the triggers you want to figure what they are for your kid. Your kid probably has learned yours, or at least a few of them, and they probably use them. 
again, my, yeah, my, the, my youngest was a bane of my existence. He and his wife now are living with us, and it's actually very good. He's very nice, and so so th good things can happen. But but he was the kind of kid that at, you know, the age of seven or eight, was just like, oh, I see your button right there. <laughs> Damn it! <laughs> and I, I remember we finally got through that with with actually being able to joke around about it. I think he got me to the point where I was crying, and he was like, "Wow, I made Daddy cry." You know, I said, "Yeah." You're very powerful. You made daddy cry. Do you want daddy to cry? And about a week later, he came back and said, I don't want daddy to cry. And he stopped. He stopped doing a lot of this. Oh, boy, was I happy. Oh. <laughs> but, um, but even then, afterwards, he'd start. He'd say, Dad, I'm going to do this. And, and I'm like, what? And he said, ha, psych. Gotcha. Um, it, it actually became very overt. Um, but your kids do know how to, to sidetrack you and to get you enough upset. that and, and they also know how to get, very often, it's a form of sometimes called splitting, where they'll get parents going after each other, and then they're off the hook. It's any kid does that, um, but uh, you see it actually probably a little more with kids who are more dependent on their parents um, for daily functioning. Um, they're more likely to do that kind of splitting. But it's real common and normal for it's like, you know, mom says no, let me go to dad kind of thing. Um, but, but I've seen kids who actually knew how to say something that dad would react to and mom would get mad at him for saying that. And it would just like, and then it would be between them and the kid would be just like, okay, I'm done. <laughs> and uh, I don't know if you see that in your families, but beware. Your kid may not have executive functioning going very well, but he or she probably is pretty smart anyway. I, I'm, I'm not finding a huge correlation between executive functioning problems and intelligence, actually. I mean, there are some, but, but uh, especially if you can do things that help promote that executive functioning and they get it, you end up with some very smart and functional adults who have a hard time as kids. Um, so, behavior crisis prevention. This is one where I'm going to want you all talking to me about what you did. Some of you I know have had to redesign your house a little bit in order to have your kid there. I mean, it's typical with toddlers. They have the little, you know, lock, drawer lockers and, and uh, ways to secure things. But um, once you have a 10-year-old who knows how to pick locks and things like that, it's, it becomes kind of hard. But what have some of you done in your own homes? To actually modify your environment to deal with uh, some of the behavioral or safety issues. What happened if you didn't? Should I ask? You don't have to. <laughs> okay, I won't ask. Um, yeah, so 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 you ended up having to do an environmental solution because having that door shut and locked was like not a not a good thing, right? Um, other things. Anybody is anybody having to like put locks on all their kitchen cabinets or things like that? Well, I have a, a child that actually has Trotter Willie syndrome. Mm. Um, That's hard not to use restrictions with that. Um, she actually does not see food at this point, um, so we don't have locks. But that's sort of separate, I think, from. I mean, with her condition, I think it's. A, I mean, she does have executive functioning issues. But she also, her brain just doesn't tell her that she's in school, which is why. She's right. How did I? Maybe we should talk later. Right. Well, no. How, how, how did you? How did you deal with the with the food issues? Because I, I mean, you hear about very severe restrictions being Absolutely. put in place with with Crater Willie kids. Yeah, and we can talk about that later. I mean, um, I just think that she hasn't gotten there yet. Um, I think it varies with ages. Sometimes. Oh, how how old is she? She's so, you know, I think historically we would have seen it much sooner, but um, I just think that she's been managed since she's been about seven months her diet. And um, that makes I think sense. she's very rigid, so I think that that works in our favor a little bit. Because she, she'll adhere to rigid, she rigid rules and routines. Yeah. 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 You know what? I've only dealt with folks who had Prater Willie um, as adults. 
like in their 30s, I think was the youngest I dealt with. They already had a pretty wide repertoire. Staff were very, they, it was in a group home situation and, and this person was perpetually somehow getting a hold of credit card numbers of the staff and things like that, ordering pizza at three yeah. in the night. You know, just some amazing things. So, amazing amounts of cognition Absolutely. went into the food seeking. Yeah. And it was like, could, could you use some of that skill and do this instead? <laughs> But, uh, yeah. Um, distraction, redirection, gentle humor. You got to manage yourself first. Remember what I was saying before? You go into crisis and someone else goes into crisis. When you can, can you feel it coming on when your kid is going into crisis? So, as soon as you get that feeling, you want to try to redirect things, you want to try to distract. Now, I, I went the other day and, and, and uh, visited a family who had a, a cute little, I think he's six, and, uh, and I found for the first, first time that I can remember, my distraction and redirection techniques did not work. He was like, he wanted pencils. Now, he doesn't even draw or anything like that, but he likes to arrange the pencils, and the pencils are hidden in his house because he has several siblings, and it's their pencils. And of course, he wants their pencils, not his pencils. He has his pencils. And this kid, for 30 minutes, I could not distract him. I could not get him anywhere else. I, I got to say, when I, uh, at, at the point I left, I said, you know, I appreciate stubbornness. It's a skill. But your child is, will wear anybody down. And, and, but I didn't have to tell these parents that. <laughs> they, they knew that. It was kind of interesting to me. But for most folks, if you can stay relaxed, that's the most important thing. I, I mean, I recently uh, was was uh, directing a, a, what's called a psychiatric rehab program. It was basically a group for folks with uh, both developmental and um, mental health diagnoses, and they were they all had long histories of violence and things like that. We went two years, and what we did was we modeled positive, respectful behavior. We said expectation for positive behavior. And even when someone started to melt down, we dealt with it respectfully, and the other folks got to watch that. It was really amazing what happened, but um, it was really the, um, that, that, that whole issue of modeling what you want to see. A lot of times we focus on stimuli, and reinforcers and things like that. But honestly, that applies to pigeons. I mean, the, I mean the, the, the behavioral model applies to all forms of life, just about. That you can actually use those behavioral principles to change behavior. But that is not the highest form of learning for humans. Social modeling is the highest form, probably. But there's also mastery learning. But, but, I mean, what we know, if you go into um, particularly less developed society, which you'll see as a kid who sits around a campfire and watches women weaving, and after a couple of years of watching it, just does it, and is able to have fairly complex skills doing that social modeling. Social modeling becomes a problem for you if you've got your kid in a classroom where people are modeling things that you don't want them to see. I hear that a lot from parents. It's like, yeah, there's this other kid in there and it's always, and now we're seeing that behavior. And um, what I will say is that when that happens, you can usually snuff it back out with your kid, but you want to do it early. <laughs> um, but, but social modeling is very, very powerful. If, um, if you have a family that smokes, it doesn't matter what lectures they give their kid, their, their kids at a much higher risk of smoking. When, later on, um, and I, I think that's true also for, for violence. I mean, I've, I've worked with families who thought the way to stop a kid from being aggressive was to hit him. Actually, you're teaching them that that is the appropriate thing to do when you're mad at somebody is to hit them. And that's the lesson that gets learned very often. And so what we sometimes think of as punishment isn't punishment. Technically, punishment is something that reduces a behavior that you don't want to see. And so, um, well, actually any behavior is punished if you see it reduced because of something you do. I found that sometimes in that sense, there were some folks where if you gave them a hug before they totally escalated, that calmed them way down. And in a sense, was 
punishment in that it reduced the behavior, but and, and you know, and technically it was punishment, but it's not social punishment is different. Let me give let me give an example where where the whole punishment model came from. You go to your refrigerator, you take some milk, you pour the milk, you take a drink, and it's really bad. I mean, it really tastes nasty. So after that, you're going to be careful about, you know, is it, how old is this milk? You're going to sniff it. You're going to, you know, it modifies your behavior. But you're never going to think that that milk is controlling your life, trying to tell you what to do, taking over. You know, it's social punishment is entirely different because it's in the context of a relationship. And, uh, and anything that you model in your relationship, you got to understand that your kid will do it back. So kids, kid, kids who receive a lot of punishment, they all often give out a lot of punishment too. <laughs> and uh, which is another reason why I tend to like to stay away from it. Did I stay away from it entirely in my own family? You can't, <laughs> you can't. Because your kids get to know you too well, they get you really mad, um, that kind of thing. But you, you do want to consider that that doesn't necessarily make things better. What makes things better is finding a different way. Um, to, to, to deal with disagreements or stress or whatever stress it is that's causing that kind of meltdown. Um, any of you work on setting expectations? You go over what's going to happen during the day. Yeah. Um, take a step back to the um, Parenting to be an opportunity for self improvement. Yes, it is. Um, I discovered that my kids imitated me with perfection. <laughs> it's sometimes a bit disturbing, isn't it? <laughs> making myself into the person I wanted my children to become. Uh, you know what? It's a good strategy. Did it work for you? Excellent. Yeah. But I, one thing I took off the table is that they would never be hit. I promised them early on, I said, I don't care what you do, I will never hit you. And they, you know, every once in a while I would threaten them. I said, now I'm going to beat the shit out of you. <laughs> and they would say, no, you are. They knew. But they were never afraid of me. Well, you know, and sometimes what people do to manage the behavior punitively is, is you make the kid afraid of you. And it does sometimes mean that you will get better behavior because they don't want to do it in front of you because they don't want, want but it usually means they're going to pass on the stress. You ever notice we pass on the stress? Believe me, your spouse notices if you come home and you're all stressed out and mad, your spouse notices you're passing on the stress. Um, that we tend to do that with each other, venting or however it is. Um, but uh, I, I think trying to be the person that you want your kids to be in terms of behavior, that's actually a pretty good strategy. Um, you'd be surprised how many families are trying to get their kid to do the opposite of what they're doing. They don't listen to you. They watch what you do. They do watch what you do. And actually, sometimes they listen to you. They just don't necessarily do what you want. <laughs> Um, it's actually in their job description during certain phases of development. They are not, I mean, you know, teenagers are supposed to be difficult. They really are. That's part of their job. They're trying, that's nature's way of making you guys separate enough so they can go off. And honestly, you can't, you, it's very hard to establish a relationship. And I see this a lot in this field and around kids who don't have the executive functioning. Their parents are still taking care of them in a lot of ways. At, by the time they're like 18, 19, 20, and what happens is what I call developmental friction, that the kid knows that they're dependent on you and they're really mad at you for it. And, uh, and because they can't separate. It's like usually what happens in the course of typical development is at some point the kid leaves the home and then they end up kind of coming back and renegotiating a relationship with their parents as adults. But if they never leave the home, that's a very difficult process to complete. And, uh, and so I, you'll see 30, 35-year-olds who are still like acting like teenagers with their parents, who actually may be great out in the community, or other people are just like, really? She gives you a hard time? But if, if you were going to go watch, 
She does. She gives them a very hard time. And part of it is because she just hasn't got that separate life that she wanted. Um, and maybe she's afraid to separate, really, and, and doesn't really want to go somewhere else, but it doesn't feel comfortable. Um, yeah? What do you mean by the term uh, social punishment? Social punishment is when someone does something to someone else in order to deter something unpleasant to someone else in order to deter behavior. It's not natural punishment in the environment, like with the milk or something like that, or you trip over something, you're careful about it afterwards. It's actually someone's taking actions against you. And part of the problem is that they're also modeling something um, for you that you don't want them doing that. Like when, when, when you were, basically, if you're teaching the, your kid that it's okay to be mean to somebody in some fashion, which is the way they perceive it. If you're mad at them, then you're giving them permission when they're mad to be mean. And it, but it's not conscious permission, but it's just what I see is it's like if, if if they're seeing it, if they're experiencing it, they have no it's they, they have no problem with going ahead and doing it. You want a kid like if any of us start to lose control or have a meltdown. We feel bad about it afterwards. We try to figure out, oh man, huh, I don't want that to happen again. Um, and we try to do something about it. But if we don't know that it's a problem, we don't. We don't try to do anything about it. And so that's part of the self-monitoring and self-improvement. But also just remember, you're always, you're modeling behavior. Yes. So are you talking about siblings? No, I'm talking about adult child. Oh, okay, adult child. And so you've got a very tall 13-year-old who, who, who believes they're 21 yes. and perfectly capable yes. of making all their own decisions. Yes. Um, and you don't agree. <laughs> I hear a lot, too. Oh, they're just teenagers. That's normal. But you know that it's a little Um, what I would say is that to build up frustration tolerance, or that's a, that's a big issue, is being able to build up frustration tolerance uh, for folks. And um, the best way to do that is to work right on the edges, to actually get them frustrated to a point that they don't quite lose it, and then back off. And if you do that over time, you will find that, that they will tolerate more, usually. But you're talking about a 13-year-old who's already, it sounds like he's, he's advanced in his, uh, in his rejection of, of parental authority. Um, and uh, I, I, I think, and I had have, I have a 13-year-old like that where we basically agreed, and I don't know if you can do with this with your child, but agreed, look, you have the right to make a final decision about this, but I have the right to challenge you, and, and you need to discuss it with me. But ultimately, because honestly, if he's big, he's making his own decisions anyway, isn't he? So, so what I would say is actually make that a process, but make it a process he has to go through because if he has executive functioning problems, he's not taking everything into consideration. His judgment isn't very good. And, and so you want to leave in there, all right, you, you are the decision maker, but we need to talk. Because really all you're doing is acknowledging the reality. Um, and so that's kind of what I did with actually my kid when he was 11. I said, when you're 13, this will happen. And, uh, and he was waiting you know, on his 13th birthday. It's like, and now I make the final decisions, you know. But, uh, 
But I had to live with that. And he did make some bad decisions. Fortunately, I, you know, I think parents of teenagers, at some point, you're just kind of praying <laughs> that everybody survives, you know? Um, but, but, but it's hard, and it's, and it's harder if your kid has special needs that make them particularly vulnerable, or like a, a tall 13-year-old, if they have a meltdown in the community, police are gonna get involved and all kinds of other, you know, it's not pretty. Um, and and, uh, and it's, it's not like that doesn't really impact your life, because it does, and it impacts theirs too, and it usually makes them mad when that happens too. <laughs> so, um, I don't know, has anybody had, anybody's kids old enough that you're getting, that you've had, police intervention because neighbors called or because something you had a, mel a public meltdown and your kid was big enough that er someone got scared nobody here's experience with that yet you got close ones um many of you may experience that towards um in, in later adolescence but uh one thing i would tell you is that what i've seen is that locally in northern virginia the police are really well trained if you have someone where you're concerned that they might cross the line and end up getting, you know, in serious trouble when it's not really, it's, it's really a clinical issue, it's not a criminal issue, but police don't always know that. And, and but uh, you actually want to contact the police and talk to them and let them know that you have a kid who has some struggles with executive functioning so that they don't come and be because if the police don't know that and they come in they're just going to follow standard procedure which is to escalate things and if the person doesn't calm down you know that can get i've had a lot of folks that i work with who've been tased a couple of times um taken to jail things like that where it's just like this is not helpful a few folks that i've worked with it actually was helpful because they never wanted that to happen again so it it actually did help because, it, but it, because it was outside of the family. Um, there's some others. Yeah. Go ahead. You've been talking a lot about controlling uh, behavior and behaviors uh, as the kids get older and out of teens. You know, it starts to be a lot about the demands, of, the escalating demands of school, schoolwork, homework, planning, preparing. You know, where we get into a lot of sort of crises at home is around, you know, what what is on Schoology? Have they looked? Have they had their stuff? And, and, and secondary issue, which I don't know if it's relevant to anybody else, but, you know, a lot of these uh, issues are genetic. And so, you know, sometimes the adults are also struggling with executive function issues. Mm -hmm. And we're called upon to, to be part of the solution to our children when we ourselves are struggling with the same issues. So that becomes very important. It, it does. Re rephrase the question part of that. Yeah, yeah, go ahead. So, you know, what I, what I would say is that, um, one, if the school is amenable, you want to try to work with them around those issues. Um, if you're having, re, you know, blowout fights every other night over homework, um, there are some accommodations that could be made so that they're not bringing home enough homework. I mean, that's, you see that even sometimes with kids who aren't identified as having any issues, where it's so aversive you know, it's not good to have an aversive homework situation. That's not good for learning. That's not good for family relations. It's not good. And, and so the, and, and even the, you know, even a typical kid sometimes is bringing stuff home that uh, you don't blame them for not wanting to do it, honestly. Um, and, uh, and, and some of us didn't have great experiences in school. So, it's, you know, and have struggled with some of the same things as you're saying. And you're right, there is a genetic piece very often. Very often, even when, I, when, when we're getting called in and you have a kid who's been diagnosed as being on the spectrum, at least one parent has a lot of features of being on the spectrum and, in fact, had similar kinds of issues, maybe not as severe when they were kids growing up, but they had 
a lot of social issues or difficult issues in school. Um, so there, there, there is a genetic component. Um, and what I would say is, do your best, forgive yourself when you don't, but also don't be afraid to go back and say, you know what, I struggled with this and I lost it and I'm sorry about that, but let's see how we can keep that from happening. Problem solved with the person. A lot of times, you know, some of the power struggles that I see are because the parent wants a child to do something on their own. Well, to get there, sometimes you have to do it with them for a while. And so a lot of times, the best support is doing something with somebody. I see that professionally in like group homes and stuff like that, that uh, where the staff are just prompting the person to do it. And it's like, just go do it with them. Work on their skills. And once they're really comfortable doing it, you can fade out. But if they're not willing to do it alone now, you better do it with them because you'll never get it done. Uh, you know, it's just not going to happen. And a, a lot of times we think, you know, to promote autonomy, you shove someone out on their own. It's kind of like throwing someone into a swimming pool if, if they don't want to learn how to swim. Well, they'll learn, you know. <laughs> and, uh, I, you know, I see that kind of approach used, but it almost never is uh, helpful. Talking about schoolwork and you talked about uh, bringing these things to the attention of the school and maybe some accommodations and such. Uh, do you have any insights you can share on standardized testing? Because it seems like the uh, requirement to sort of do okay as well as standardized testing is you have to have your executive functioning you know, act together. It's kind of like the requirement going in. But if you don't and you struggle in that area, it might be some. Um, so the standardized testing, the problems that kids have with that often are more related to anxiety um, and getting worked up. Um, and, you know, I, I, I discovered this actually in graduate school. I was asked to help some international students who had never, you know, they could come in and write an essay like, you know, they had the book memorized, but they come in and take a standardized test and they, they get a low grade, um, which in many cases was really unacceptable because they'd lose their scholarship and, and things like that. And, uh, and it actually happened when my wife was in graduate school. She took the same course that I had taken, and I knew she knew the material, and she was doing poorly on the standardized tests, and she had a history of that. And so we went in and we got a copy of the test and went over, and what we found was most standardized tests, you're going to run into things that you don't know how to do. Now, if you stay relaxed and breathe and say, oh, well, go on to the next one, you're going to do okay. But if you start to get upset or anxious and stop breathing, which is what people tend to do, then what, we, what I found with my wife was she, sometimes she'd get that hard question, sometimes she wouldn't because there's always like a little bit of uh, luck to those standardized tests. But the next two, where she knew the answer, she missed them because she had gotten so tensed up. Um, so what I would say is going over it, you know, e even pulling up some sample um, tests and going ahead and doing it with a snack and, and a sense of good humor. All right, let's see how we can do on this. You know, and make it more like a game and get, and get them to relax a little bit and, when you, and actually observe the muscles and say, oh, you begin to tense up, tensing up, not good. Do your breathing. Because, I mean, honestly, that breathing, that is the way to get those chemicals to wash out. And most of the techniques for calming someone down are really about breathing. And there's a lot of ways you can do it from tricking. Uh, I, I remember I had a nephew, very hyper, had um, ADHD, and was in a restaurant with him, and his parents were just going to kill him. I mean, he was just like up and down and over and over and over. And I said, you know what? I got something in my pocket here that you could earn if you could sit still for a minute. But I know you can't do that, so never mind. And he's like, hey, I can do that. I can do that. And, and so he sat there for like a minute. And he was like, <laughs> you know, and it was just clearly huge effort. And I'm like, oh, no, please just move or something because I don't want to give that to you. Oh, oh, gosh. Oh, no. Oh. You got it. Well, turned out a minute wasn't long enough. So he was still like that. And I, and, and I said, all right, well, you got it for a minute. Obviously, I made it too easy. Three minutes. 
if you do this for three minutes, I got something even better in my pocket for you. And he was like, I think I can do it. And he did it. And by the end of three minutes, he was totally relaxed and the dinner went fine. And so with all of that, I was very aware. I'm just trying to get him to sit and breathe a little while. And so it doesn't have to be an exercise. There's other ways you can do it, but essentially, yeah, you want the person breathing. I, I, I say exercise, going for a walk is often good. Exercise gets people breathing too. That's something that's often underutilized. Uh, that's, I have trouble getting the exercise in too, but the fact is exercise is a good way to manage stress. And most meltdowns are about stress of one form or another. Everybody doesn't experience the same things as stressful, but it's basically the stress becomes too much, whatever it is. And, and you lose it. And honestly, any one of us under sufficient stress will show some kind of psychiatric symptom because everything is in that diagnostic manual. I guarantee it's all in there. It is. Of a sort. Of a sort. Um, but it, it wasn't about not showing the bad behavior. It was about showing the behavior I wanted. And it was like a one-time thing. This wasn't a pattern I was setting up. This was a challenge rather than a bribe, I, I think. But yes, if I did that regularly with him, yes, he'd say, hey, I'll sit still if you give me a buck. <laughs> you know? And that's what you don't want to happen. The, that, that sense that, all right, I'll do what you want, but what's it worth? Because you don't want your kid like hey, putting out their hand, yeah, what, what's it worth to you, mom? It's like, okay, we went wrong somewhere here. Um, sometimes that'll happen anyway. When, sometimes when you want someone to do something, like, you know, if it's about cleaning the kitty litter, which nobody wants to do, you know, I'd say that that might be a case where you're saying, you know what, you could earn it for that, you know. Um, and, and and I'd make it nice, pat and juicy to get the, get the behavior started, but I don't think you'll find many kids who will take over the kitty litter, so <laughs> um, I could never get mine to. Yeah. Um, so when you, if you have a kid, you know, like I have a seventh grader who doesn't want to do homework, can't get to the least of time. You know, like what? How do you? How do you like set up something to help them remember to do it and you know look at their behavior? I mean, it's just such a, a struggle with us every day. Um, you know, how do you? How do you kind of motivate? Yeah, I, I, I mean, we're talking about how do you schedule time and activities in a sense. And you've got preferred activities and non-preferred activities. Um, and what I'd look at first is as soon as you got your homework done, then you get to go do this. And so, so that they'll want to get it done so they can go do this other thing. Um, honestly, that may not always cut it. Um, there are some kids who you really want them taking care of the work at, at school before they come home. And depending on the school um, and, and teacher, they sometimes it, there can be accommodations made in their schedule to try to get that done. It depends how big an issue um, it is. It's, I mean, it's a very typical issue for anyone getting their kids to do homework. Um, when I hear a parent say, oh, no, my kid just always just takes care of that, I'm kind of like, really? <laughs> That would be nice. Um, some do, but an awful lot of kids uh, struggle around that, and it really depends um, how serious it is. If it's tearing your family apart, I'd bring it back to the school and see could they have you come with a solution. Um, I know that uh, as a parent, at one point with one of my kids, I had had someone come in from the outside. It wasn't my young one who actually tore me up; it was my older one, but he was having struggling in some subjects, and. Uh, and he didn't want that from us, but he, he, he was in his early teens. And it's like, at some point, they don't want the support from their parents. And th then it helps to have money to pay somebody. <laughs> but uh, yeah, I mean, the whole, fi the whole financial piece of having a kid with special needs is kind of rough. Um, I, I mean, I do find I'm a little distressed sometimes at the, and actually I'm speaking now about Maryland system that I kind of left, but it seemed like you needed to, 
in order to get services that had gotten to the point that you needed to be able to hire an advocate and a lawyer. And so it was actually the people with the most resources who were getting access to the public services the most easily. Um, and I really felt for some of the other families who couldn't access the services because they couldn't afford an advocate. Um, but, uh, you know, th th there are a lot of struggles around the whole financial piece. I mean, to the degree that we're talking about someone having to, to do the work, we're talking about human labor. Human labor is very expensive. And when you go look at like an average group home, how much do you think it costs to keep someone in a group home for a year to the taxpayer? I guarantee you it's over $150,000. And, and, uh, and especially when you start looking at the oversight systems and stuff, it, it goes higher than that. And, you know, there's a part of me that says, hey, give me $150,000, I'll take your kid. You know, it's like, um, you, you'd think you could get a lot for that, but, but, uh, but having aids and things like those folks are expensive. Um, it does cost a lot. That, yeah, yeah, bundle it, yeah. All right, this is what I wanted to see happening before. You all know a lot. You know about visual timers. You know that that really helps someone so much. Talking about chunking things. That's, that, that's a good way to do it. How much can you tolerate? Yeah. 10 minutes is too much, let's do it in five minute increments. And eventually that'll build up, hopefully, hopefully. <laughs> but, um, but yeah, uh, when, when you're talking about scheduling and stuff, you have a lot of kids, if you have a kid who, who, who can't wait, can't inhibit, <laughs> it's an executive function, and so they have no patience and stuff, a lot of times a visual timer will help them. A lot of times you have a kid who, whose language processing is not great. A lot of times having visual cues will work much better. Um, I, I, I'm thinking about a eight-year-old um, you know, dealing with last year who, you know, we were trying to prompt him, but he was, he was supposed to be using the potty every hour. He was supposed to make an attempt, and supposedly that wasn't a problem. And, but I, I actually had someone else in there who was working with him, and I was, I was observing. And he did it over and over and over, prompted verbally, and was getting just no response. And then, uh, then I handed him. I, I saw that the, the family had, because we it's our first time in the house. The family had some icons, and I just picked up a, to a picture of a toilet and handed it to the person. The person held it up, and the kid went because he wasn't processing the language. It was like going in. He might have understood it, but it didn't come back out as a response because not everything was hooked up to that executive functioning thing. That's the problem, it's like everything's going in, everything's going out of here, but there's a lot of things that can go wrong in terms of, you know, if, if, if you have if you have brain injury, it's like certain parts of your brain, that information just isn't coming through. I've known people who would do the same, really something that would get them into horrible trouble, like getting raped. There, there was a young woman who was like, who, who had brain damage and who, when she saw someone she was attracted to, it was just like everything else went out the window. And she couldn't process. And she would end up getting in really horrible situations. And she'd go to the police and say she was right. It was like, then when, when, uh, when the police questioned her, she was saying, yeah, well, he wanted me to take my panties off, too. It was like, it was, uh, probably shouldn't even bring that one up. That, that, that one was scary to me <laughs> because uh, it, it was very hard. But, um, but sometimes information just doesn't make it to the brain. And so the person really does not have the capacity for judgment. And I think if you have a kid where you've worked and tried at it, I mean, basically at some point you may decide to make accommodations and just make sure that kinds of certain kinds of supervision are in place or something like that. You may need to do that. But because sometimes 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 you can't fix the executive functions. But a lot of times, a lot of times you can help them to develop. Daughter, uh, it's quite some time on that. Uh, 
which means possibly he was on standardized ACT, which kind of fights itself. He got an incredible score on the ACT. He has just made it in a couple of five years. So he did the work here. She takes tests very well. That's often what the work through some classes. So I don't feel like anything that they project your function is that's very trouble getting it done. Getting it done, pl planning to do it. Some of the accommodation mm -hmm. shops also does have a line of um, uh, uh, homework load. You know, so she has to demonstrate the mastery of stuff. But you know, if, if she makes the test, now she understands. That's not her idea. Sorry. Yeah. She's supposed to. We're supposed to. We're supposed to. But anyway, knowing what to ask for takes a little bit of research sometimes uh, of what's out there because it's not always. Uh, it's not always offered. I think that's true, and a lot, you know, a lot of parents with kids with special needs find themselves lifelong advocates, and uh, a lot of families I've worked with have a great deal of expertise about whatever condition it is that their child has, more more so than the doctors that they're taking them to, things like that, um, and they're actually keeping track of research and stuff like that. But what I would say is, if you're not sure. Don't be afraid to go to your computer and Google um, school accommodations. Uh -oh. oh, I'm six minutes over already. So um, I think I need to wind this down. <laughs> Let me see how close I was to the end here. Um, so we've talked a lot about a couple. There's two th two more things that I'd like to emphasize: discipline. Do it individually. When, when you discipline somebody in front of other people, you get face-saving behaviors, particularly the older they get, middle school, high school, you get face-saving behaviors. Um, and, and so a lot of times the best thing is to pull the person aside and talk to them privately. And it's, and it's cool, but, it's, but public humiliation, uh, they'll get you back. <laughs> and. Uh, and intrinsic motivations. Um, I, I've heard a lot of people say, well, you know, especially I've heard teachers say, you know, this child is not motivated. But that's usually not true. It's just that they're not motivated to do what you want them to do. And I've heard parents say the same thing. But you watch the kid, and they're very motivated for the things they want to do. Um, but, you know, for, for the kid, and I'll go earlier on you, and this was a simpler example, but for the kid who's, you know, obsessed with dinosaurs, and you're trying to teach them numbers, count dinosaurs, not cats, because you have a lot more luck. Look, look for the intrinsic motivations that people have, because I, I haven't met a kid who isn't motivated. I met a lot of kids who weren't motivated to do what I wanted them to do, or what the teacher wanted them to do, or what their parent wanted them to do. And so a lot of times you got to go to where they are to pull them over a little bit. And they'll start making some accommodation for your motivations, if you make some accommodations for theirs, is what I usually think. Um, okay. Last one. If your kid is doing something and they know they're not supposed to do it, don't give them a lecture. Don't teach someone something they already know. All you're doing is giving attention to it. Walk away from it, um, redirect something. But often parents find themselves, as, you know, you shouldn't do that because this and this and this and it's like the kid already knows. In fact, all they're trying to do is get you to lose it. Because <laughs> you know? I, I, I will say a lot of times when you get into your teen, well, middle school on, you'll have kids who sometimes they're, they're, the function of the behavior is to get their parent to lose it. Because it makes them feel very powerful when they can get you to have a meltdown. And that's uh, kind of a scary thought. <laughs> Um, so I, I've run over, and so I think I'm done, but uh, I, I will hang around for a little bit for any of you who gluttons for punishment.